Beginning with this lecture, we're going to spend some time looking at uh, a variety of ways to store data um, using different types of data structures. Okay, uh, each of these data structures was designed with a specific uh, purpose in mind, and we're going to begin here um, with two of the most commonly used data structures, and um, they're referred to as queues. The essential thing that is common to all of the queues that we're going to study is that data is inserted or um, added to the queue in some, let's say, arbitrary way, but there's always some um, specific way, some determined way in which the data is then later extracted or taken out of the queue. Okay? And the two types of queues that we're going to study in this lecture um, have very, very simple rule for this extraction. We're going to implement these queues using arrays. So actually they're essentially just going to be arrays, but the way in which we use the array is what um, turns them into queues. Okay, and the two types of queues that we'll look at are known as FIFO queues and stacks. These are at least the most common names I would say for these uh, these types of queues and the ones I'll be using. Okay, so the extraction rule for FIFO queue and also for stack depends directly on the order in which the data were inserted into the queue. Okay, they're not difficult to implement using arrays. So let me introduce the FIFO queue first. FIFO stands for first in, first out. And as the name suggests, the data uh, is extracted from the queue in exactly the same order in which it is inserted. <clears throat> Okay, FIFO queues are very common, quite useful, and, and, and also the phenomenon is something you experience in everyday life. Uh, people often uh, use the phrase, first come, first serve, and uh, when you think of a FIFO queue, you can think of a bunch of customers lining up for something, maybe at the bank or to buy tickets. Uh, the customer that arrives first is the one that gets served first. A stack is precisely the opposite idea. Okay, so with a stack, uh, the first one, the first piece of data inserted would be the last one extracted. Okay, or we could also say the last piece of data inserted is the first one extracted. Okay, for, so for this reason, stacks are also quite often called LIFO queues, standing for last in first out, but um, I tend to just say stack because I think myself and other people um, have trouble with LIFO because you don't remember, well, do it last in, first out, or do we call it first in, last out? It's the same thing. I prefer just to say stack. Languages such as Java and C++ generally have facilities or at least um, libraries, standard libraries, that uh, are easy to work with FIFO queues and stacks. So here I'm thinking, for example, in C++, there's the so-called standard template library. And by means of that, a C++ programmer can readily develop FIFO queues and stacks in all kinds of, for all sorts of purposes. However, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in teaching you uh, about prefabricated um, data structures at all. Uh, what I want us to do is concentrate on, on seeing how to build data structures from scratch.
Okay, so specifically here, we'll be uh, building FIFO queues and stacks and implementing them using arrays, as I already indicated. Okay, well, in doing so, uh, when, the, when the queue is being used at any given moment, the idea is that only a portion of the array will be uh, actively holding data. Okay, and now it's very important that because you can't um, enlarge an array after you build it, um, you could argue that, that certain things could be done, but yes, but, but an array itself um, is some fixed amount of memory, and once you, uh, once you introduce the array into your program, that's it. That's how much memory you have for the array. And so my point here is, using this approach to building FIFO queues and stacks, we have to be careful to plan uh, and make sure that the array is large enough to hold all of the data that we might want to put in it at any given time. Okay? Later on, we'll take up the idea of building data structures such as FIFO queues and stacks in other ways, in different ways, that do allow for dynamic expansion, okay? Um, so that while the program is running, if, if we haven't allocated enough room for the data, we can uh, basically request more data, request more memory from the operating system dynamically. But, but that's later. To keep things, uh, to, to simplify the examples here, let's, let's assume that the data are just uh, floating point numbers. Okay, and let's take a look at stacks first. The reason being that implementing a stack actually is easier, presents fewer challenges, as we'll see. Okay, so we'll begin by introducing an array of doubles named stack. I'm assuming that this, this quantity max size is large enough okay, to uh, make sure the stack is big enough to hold the data that we're going to put, put in it. And we're, gonna, we're also going to maintain a variable named uh, stack size initialized to zero and of course, stack size is not the size of the array. Stack size is going to tell us the size of the stack. In other words, how much data is currently being stored on the stack. And in the beginning, the stack is empty. We'll make things a little easier on ourselves, too, by assuming that the array and the variable stack size are global variables. And therefore, uh, since we're going to have a few different functions, um, these different functions can share those variables, and we won't have to pass them around by means of parameters. So for stacks, actually, all we need are these two basic functions. Okay, so we have an insert function and we have an extract function. Um, these are as, as simple as they can be. Um, in fact, you might argue they're too simple. We'll get to that. Um, so the insert function receives a double precision floating point number by means of parameter x, and it inserts that number into the stack. Okay? Well, now to be very precise about this, what does it do? Okay, the first thing it does is it copies x into the stack array at position stack size, after which it increments stack size. Okay, so think about the very first time this is called. What was the value of stack size initially? Well, we just saw a moment ago, zero. 
Okay, so the first time this is called, it'll copy whatever number is in X, it'll copy into position zero in the array stack, and that's precisely where we want it. That's the beginning of the array. Okay, after it puts the number into position zero, uh, it'll increment stack size, stack size becomes one, accurately uh, remembering that there's actually one, uh, one number stored in the stack. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Um, the extraction function to go along with this can also be written very, very simply as follows. Um, just says return stack bracket minus minus stack size. So let's think about that. Let's say that let's think about that in the context of what we just did. We just inserted one number into the stack. The the value of stack size was one, right? Okay. When we call, if we were to immediately follow that insertion with an extract, what would happen? Well, it would first thing it would do is decrement stack size. Okay. So stack size changes from one to zero, and then um, it it returns the data that is stored at position zero in the stack. Okay, and that's exactly what we want. That's exactly the datum, the piece of data that was previously stored using insert. Okay, now you might be a little squeamish about this and say, well. Okay, that number is returned, but it still exists, it still lives inside the array. And you're absolutely right. We haven't removed it from positions of the array named stack. But because we decremented stack size and stack size is now zero, that, that piece of data is effectively no longer in the stack. Okay? The, um, the array contains a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of data, garbage mostly. I mean, well, it is all garbage to us now because stack size is zero, okay? So whatever actually is in the array at that moment, it doesn't matter. I hope you get that. I hope you're seeing what I'm saying. Um, so let's be careful. Suppose you did 10 inserts, and after each insert, stack size goes up. So... Um, you wind up putting data in stack bracket 0, then stack bracket 1, stack bracket 2, stack bracket 3, all the way up to stack bracket 9. Okay? If you now use the corresponding extract, first piece of data that you're going to return will be what's in stack bracket 9. And if you extract again, it'll return the data that you stored in stack bracket 8 and then stack bracket 7, and eventually all the way down to stack bracket 0. So this will behave as we want a stack to behave. It'll return, it'll extract the data in the opposite order uh, that it was inserted. Okay? Several points here. Again, the data still remains in the array. Okay, after the extraction, there's no reason to think the data has disappeared. But it doesn't matter. It effectively is gone, right? Because stack size will become zero. If stack size is zero, it means no data in the stack. Right? From the standpoint of the stack, the stack is empty. Even if data still remains um, on the array. Okay, well, this also raises the issue of, well, what happens if you, uh, say, do a little bit of insertion and then some extraction and then a little more insertion and then a little more extraction and so forth? There's no problem. Um, that's the kind of thing you want to be able to do with a stack. You could maybe initially insert four numbers and then perhaps extract three of them. All right, leaving one of those numbers still on the stack. Then you might insert another five numbers and then extract only two of them. Okay, and so forth and so on. And, and this would be a proper usage of a stack. But another point is, there is a danger here. 
What happens if you insert three numbers onto the stack, but then you try to extract four numbers? All right, well, that, that, that should, should raise a red flag um, in your thinking. And, and of course, that, that is something that we don't want to have happen here. If, if three numbers are inserted into the stack, and then subsequently try to extract four numbers, uh, we'll wind up decrementing stack size, and it'll become um, too much. It'll become negative one. Okay, we'll be indexing into position negative one. And um, the point is that that's an abuse of the stack. Okay, it shouldn't be allowed to happen. Um, and there's a couple ways to deal with that. One is that the programmer uh, has some system that uh, it's possible that the nature of the program that uses the stack would never ever do that. Okay. Alternatively, you can write uh, better versions of insert and extract, particularly extract here, um, to protect against that happening. So you could be careful to make sure that stack size never um, becomes negative. If there's an attempt to make stack size negative, then perhaps uh, perhaps the extract function would then throw an exception, okay, or do something special to deal with that um, situation, okay. So you can you can imagine enhancing enhancing this extract function and adding something like um, if stack size equal equal mm -hmm. zero uh, throw an exception else return stack bracket minus minus stack size okay likewise there's the danger that you might put too much data into the queue uh, what what would happen if you you try to insert too much then um, you could wind up going beyond the end of the array Okay, so here again, you could you could build in some protection that would prevent uh, over inserting into the stack. Okay, um, it it turns out that historically, uh, well. Special language has evolved for stacks that, uh, as, as, as far as I'm aware, that, that this language is only used for stacks and not for any other type of queue. Um, and it's, it's this very simple language right here. Um, people often use the word push to refer to an insertion and the word pop to refer to an extraction. So you speak about pushing data onto the stack and popping it off. Okay, um, now there are several bullets coming up here which really just repeat what I uh, was talking about when we were looking at the code. So I will just quietly step through these bullets. Okay, and that right there is actually all I have to say about stacks in this lecture. So now we'll turn our attention to FIFO queues, um, which again are not going to be terribly difficult to implement using an array, but as we'll see right away, there is a technical issue with FIFO queues that we don't experience with, um, with stacks that kind of complicates things a little bit. It's basically, the problem is that as we insert numbers into a FIFO queue and remove numbers from the FIFO queue, um, we wind up unable to use the initial portion of the array. 
Okay, uh, think about stacks for a second. Suppose you put 20 numbers into a stack, and then you, so you push 20 numbers onto the stack, and then you say, let's, they say you pop, you pop 10 numbers off the stack. Well, that means that there's still 10 numbers on the stack, and, and where are they? Where are those numbers physically in the array? And the answer is they're at the beginning of the array, okay? So we're still using the initial portion of the array even though we've extracted some of the data from the stack, okay? Well, in contrast, the natural way to, um, to build a FIFO queue, if you put 20 numbers into the queue and then you extract 10 numbers, well, remember, the ones that you'll be extracting are the numbers at the beginning of the array, right? I mean, you'd be the, it'd be the ones that you put into the queue first, all right? And so if you do things in the obvious way, you'll wind up uh, with the 10 numbers that remain not occurring at the beginning of the array, but occurring a little further into the array. And in fact, you won't be able to use the positions at the beginning of the array anymore. Okay, I, I think this will all be clear as we jump into the code. So let's start. Um, right, so let's jump right in here and look at some initial code to get the ball rolling here in the case of a FIFO queue. All right, um, just as we did with the stack, we're going to begin with an array. Make sure the array is big enough, pretty big array. And uh, I'll name the array Q instead of stack. OK, now there's another kind of obvious difference uh, in that in the case of the stack, we had just one additional integer variable named stack size. And it simply kept track of the size of the stack, how many how many numbers were in the stack at any given moment. Okay, but with queues, with the FIFO queue here, uh, what we're really going to want is uh, two indexes, okay, into the array. So we have an index named head, and we have an index named tail. The way I'm going to do this is tail is going to correspond to, um, like, the end of a line. So if you're if you're queuing up a bunch of customers in a line, um, the next customer that comes along gets inserted at the tail. And then when it's time to extract, um, to service a customer, you take that one from the head. Okay, so here's how I'm going to do things technically. And frankly, uh, there could be... Uh, slight variations on how this is done, but this is how I plan to do things. Uh, tail will be an index that is always one pitch beyond the most recently inserted number in the queue. Okay, tail is actually going to point further ahead in this array than head does, and when it's time to insert, the insertion is going to uh, put something into the queue at position tail, and it's going to then increment tail. Okay, head is going to um, be the index of the least recently inserted number that is still in the queue. And then with that in mind, uh, insertions and extractions are pretty straightforward. Okay, as we get into this now, and we're just about to start writing code uh, for insert and extract uh, for FIFO queue. Um, but we're going to write the code in such a way that we address this problem that was discussed earlier. And let me remind you, the problem is that once we start extracting numbers from the queue, we wind up... Um, unable to use 
the portion of the array where those numbers were. Okay, so again, as I said, if you insert 20 numbers and extract 10, then the first 10 positions of the array um, will be unavailable going forward. Okay, if we do further insertions, they'll occur uh, further into the array. And so that, that is, that's kind of a wasteful thing. And, you know, you could say, well, well, okay, but you said I was going to make the array big enough to hold whatever might be inserted. Um, and what I'm saying now is we can, we can adopt a policy here in a moment that is going to make it um, so that we don't have to worry so much about having a big enough array. The way that we're going to overcome this issue about wasting the initial portion of the array um, and not being able to access it again or use it again after extractions have occurred, uh, the way we'll avoid that is by turning our array into a circular buffer. Okay, And this is a little trick that is uh, seen in a lot of situations. Um, normally you think of an array as a linear uh, kind of thing, right? You start on the left at position 0 and you continue um, we tend to think of it left to right when we when we write stuff but anyway um, there are two ends to the array, right? The starting position and the ending position uh, but the idea of the circular array is we write code, we hook code in such a way that we can pretend that after the final position in the array, the next position will be the first position in the array. Okay? So that the array cycles back from the end, it'll cycle back to the beginning. Here now is our insertion code. Um, it starts off quite similar to the stack insertion. Okay, uh, the first thing that happens is that the number that we want to insert gets inserted into the queue at position tail, and then tail gets incremented. So uh, tail is behaving very much like um, stack size behaved uh, for stacks. Okay, that part is straightforward enough, and uh, I think you see that uh, when this is done, uh, tail will be incremented, it will be the index uh, one position beyond what we just inserted. Okay, but now here's the circular buffer trick. If tail goes beyond the end of the array, meaning that if tail becomes equal to max size, then we reset tail to zero. Okay? That's this idea that if we wander off the far end of the array, we cycle back to the beginning. Here now is the matching code for extracting from a FIFO queue. Okay, so let me remind you that we have two indexes here, um, tail and head, right? Um, so the insertion is done using the index tail, and the extraction is done using the index head, all right? head is always pointing to the least recently inserted element number in the queue um, that still that still remains in the queue okay that still is in the queue um, so when we extract we extract from that position head okay so here in the code what we're doing is taking 
the number that's stored at position head in the queue, and we're copying it into a variable x, which in a moment will be returned. Okay? After that, the index head is incremented. Okay? Uh, just as we did with the tail index a moment ago, uh, we are going to worry about that index head going beyond the end of the array. So if, if head is equal to max size, meaning that head has wandered beyond the end of the array, then we reset head to zero, uh, effectively cycling around the array just as we did previously with tail. So this code that we're looking at here for the FIFO queue um, is basic in a sense that the stack code was been somewhat, well, I guess we it's kind of raw. Um, there is no protection against overfilling the array, right? Um, we worried about that a little bit. We talked about the stack. What happens if you put too much data into the array? Well, in the case of this code, you'll get some bad results. There's no protection against that. But additional code could be added to detect um, when that happens and then do something exceptional to uh, react to that happening. Um, and likewise, um, the code that's presented has no protection against extracting too much, right? Um, there could be an attempt to extract from a queue that's empty and there's nothing in the code presented to protect against that but there could be okay so that's something to think about I'd like you to just think a little bit more about these two indexes tail and head that I'm using here um, because the language, I think, could be a little bit confusing, misleading, whatnot. Um, let's say we start with the empty, an empty queue, and we insert three numbers. So every we insert, the index tail is used, and it advances, it, it gets incremented, um, one, two, three. Um, actually, after you insert three numbers, the um, index tail will be equal to three, right? It'll actually be indexing into position three, the fourth position of the array, okay? Whereas head is going to be uh, zero. It's going to be indexing at position zero, okay? So actually tail is further along than head, the way we're doing things, right? Okay, we're inserting a tail, but that's further into the array than head. Okay, so head lags behind it. Um, and, and that remains true as you use the queue until you get into this uh, circular buffer business where we cycle around, right? So it's possible that you get towards the end and and the tail index cycles around, but the head um, so far has not cycled around. Okay, so in that circumstance, the head index is actually going to be bigger than the tail index. All right, but nevertheless, um, the portion of the array that's being used for the queue. Um, consists of what's at position uh, head and then subsequent positions till you get to the end of the array and then you cycle around and start using it and, and it's also using a um, portion of the array at the beginning, right? Um, just up to but not including 
uh, tail. Okay? You think about that a little bit. Okay, and you can think about it, and you can also play with the code. I certainly want you to uh, take a look either at the Java or C++ code that is included uh, at the course site, but it's actually bundled with uh, code that we're going to discuss in the next lecture, namely linked list code. So for now, you can and should ignore that linked list code. Okay, when you're ready, um, as usual, take the self-quiz.